my goal today is to give you some lessons learned on our approach. Uh, we partnered with the SBDC and Small Business Administration to get out this educational information for you. And so there's a lot of different ways that you and your organization can put out instant communication. Who here by a raise of hands within, I don't know, 15 seconds can talk to all of your employees, all of your shareholders, all of your clients, your community, um, the, the media, and get out a singular or multi-fractional uh, message mm -hmm. that's specific and gets to people so you can move on with your day because you just had a disaster. Can I see anybody's hands? Excellent. One. Hey, you, you get an A for effort. I'll give it. <laughs> so the first thing, Matt and Brian hit it nail on the head. You have to have your message. You've got to know what you're going to say. You've got to know who you're going to say it to. You have to be timely. You have to be very prompt. But ultimately, you, you do have to have a way to get out that message. So what is a message, really? I mean, it's all about communication. If I have a message, but I walk out and I shout it out there, or I, I just start talking, but I, I walk out of this building, how many of you will receive my message to you? You won't. A message has to be sent, and a message has to be received. Otherwise, you do not have a line of communication. You have somebody lecturing, and nobody likes to be lectured to. So the goal of t today's, or what I'm going to go over briefly, is about your lines of communication. Now, there's a lot of different ways of communicating, but these should not be one of them. So if you're getting out on blowhorn, maybe that's not the best way to, to communicate. There are different options to do this. Um, who, who does have a, an alert notification system via text, via email? Can I get a, put them up high. Can I see your hands? Okay, does anybody know how to set that up? I mean, does anybody actually know, if, if you didn't raise your hand, does anybody know and just hasn't taken that step? Because nobody knows how to do it. It's difficult, right? It's taunting. It's, it's, it's uh, a lot of pressure to put that. It's easy. You gather a contact supply tree. You get, I'm the employee. You get my personal cell phone. You get my work cell phone. You get my personal email. You get my work email. It's four lines of communication. But I'm going to kind of piggyback on, on uh, one of the messages here. You don't stop there. You also get my wife's information. You get her cell phone. You get her, you get her email. Because what you want is you want to make sure that that message gets received. And you also want to know, you want to make sure that when you get that text, you know what to do with it. You simply put it in an Excel spreadsheet. You know, everybody knows how to do a mail merge. You put that through an email. Bam. Every single cell phone has a text-based email address. So mine, 720-490-4531 at VZ, Verizon Text, whatever it is, dot com. So you can send out texts through email or through text messages through your emails. And you can have those different groups set up where it's something very simple that you probably have all your employees' contact information sitting down somewhere just in a file and you can't actually use it. And that's the problem is we have this information, we've gathered it, but we don't have a way to actually leverage it within that two minutes because we've, we've been not prepar preparing for a disaster the three to six months before it happens. So the ultimate question is, what are you going to do today to get this done? Or at least on Monday, because disasters don't ever happen on weekends, right? <laughs> right, they usually happen around eight o'clock tonight. So um, your goal that I'm gonna challenge you with by the end of this month is to find one route of communication that you can contact at least your employees that it, within 30 seconds you can get a message out. It's not very difficult, and if you shoot me an email or give me a call, I'll actually give you the uh, template to do that. It's very simple, that process that I just showed you. Because this stuff doesn't be, need have to be difficult. It can be very simple if you approach it in a simple way. Because my goal and direction is, is to take business continuity and disaster recovery and turn it over on its head and make it not time intensive, not complicated, and very cost effective so you don't have to spend tons of money. Because the reason why we don't do anything is because it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, and it's very complicated. It doesn't have to be. Within 45 seconds, I just explained a way that you can contact everybody through text and through email. 
Now that's just one way communication and it's very difficult to have a conversation, what Matt and Brian were talking about, through that ways. So social media is a great platform, it's a great tool to have that open line of conversation. Because as Matt, Matthew is pointing out, it's all about the community. It's all about that message. It's about that information that you don't know that you need to tap into, to share, to pass. I mean, if you think about the world and we can overthrow governments and create new political systems out there, what can we do when there's a fire or flood? What can we do as a community to come together and rally to help each other thrive in, that, in a disaster situation? It's very easy to utilize social media. We had a raise of hands of who utilizes Facebook and Twitter here. And I would challenge you to create a portion of your crisis communication plan that leverages these routes. Now there is ways that you can broadcast information to everyone using social media. And there's the ways that you can limit that. So there's a wall. Maybe you're, you only want your employees to see information. Maybe your clients need to see that information. But maybe you don't want your competitors seeing that information. Okay? There's private groups, things you can create on your website, LinkedIn, Facebook where you can grant people access to seeing your message. It doesn't have to be public. Everybody sees you know, your dirty laundry of what's going on because you just had a disaster. That guy running out the, uh, with his hair on fire, he doesn't need to be the one that's creating that message for your company. You need to think about ways of what you want to broadcast and what you don't, but leveraging what that message is, creating templates, creating a message, but then eventually getting it out there. So there's an ultimate philosophy to approaching social media in a five-step process that if you stay to these uh, defined uh, steps, your organization will be able to confront the issues of crisis communication easily because it doesn't need to be difficult. But remember, the first thing is that try to have it be two-way conversation. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of organizations, um, I mean, get swept under for uh, when there is a disaster because they're not communicating effectively or the wrong message it gets out there. But it's really your opportunity to engage your clients, engage your prospects, show your community why you're different, and show your support for any disaster. So by, by bringing that into your company culture, you'll actually be able to thrive better during a disaster because of the way that you approach crisis communication. Um, because it shouldn't be doom and gloom scenario, you should be able to bring hope and come together and actually have a strong message of your resiliency. That's really what your message is about. It's not that we're done, this is it, we're over. It's we're going to be stronger, we're going to be better, and this is how we're going to prepare, prepare and staying focused on that. Um, now if you don't engage, that's really where the process comes because if you're not in control of your message, who is? Who's really in control of the message? If somebody calls your phone number and you don't pick up, if somebody goes to your website and it's down, and they go to your Facebook and they just see a bunch of posts, nobody's picking up my phone or my phone calls, nobody's getting back to me, they go on Twitter, why isn't XYZ company getting back to me? They're creating your message for you. So if you aren't proactive about this, you're going to be pushed aside and somebody's going to be being is going to be the face of your company. Now here's a few do's and don'ts when approaching it. And when approaching the technology aspect of it, you can leverage things, something as simple as an Excel spreadsheet, there's alert notification system. I mean, with our membership, we give you an alert notification system. I mean, it's amazing the way that technology works for um, the, the uh, amount of data that goes through. Think about leveraging an organization outside of the, of the county or outside of the state to work with you to relay that message. It's interesting, in Superstorm Sandy, when we simultaneously recovered 109 organizations in 36 hours, that they couldn't make a phone call across the street, but they could make a phone call to California because of the way that the, the uh, towers are set up to receive messages differently. So think about the way that you, you go towards your crisis communication plan. Do you want an internal crisis communication plan or do you want to have somebody help you that may be out of your network area that can broadcast that message for you? 
Do you want to do voice um, activated calls where you have everybody call into uh, a message where you can listen to the message from your CEO and where you can leave a message saying, yes, I received your message and we, my family is safe? Um, or do you want to have somebody um, do multiple calls for you where you reach out to a company and you say, all right, you and I, we're going to create a partnership right here. I'm going to give you all my contact information. You're going to give me my contact, your contact information. When you have a disaster, I'm going to call your people. When you have a disaster, I'm going to call all your people. There's a lot of people here in the room where we all can come together as a community and leverage simple, cost-effective memorandums of understanding where we know what you're going to do during a disaster and what I'm going to do for you. And it doesn't cost us anything. And it brings us together as a partnership. I'll give you a few time, a few minutes to write down some do's and don'ts, but here are some more. I mean, hashtags are really, really important to leverage in, in social media. If you do not know what a hashtag is, can you just raise your hand? I, I don't want to embarrass you. This is more of a, we need to explain this. Hashtag is basically a searchability to, what, to understand what is going in on a conversation. If I put hashtag SBDC preparedness summit in every single one of my tweets, if I search that, every single thing will, that, that has that conversation will come up. So if you, if you search, you know, hashtag Manitou Springs, you will see everything that has to deal with that, that information. It's very important to know just the basics of this. And you don't, nobody has to be an expert on this. Trust me, if you have millennials in your organization, you already have experts at your fingertips. Um, <laughs> Uh, my suggestion is never listen to anybody who's over 30 years old um, for this stuff. Always, you know, go for the younger crowd. Teenagers are really good. They'll, sh they'll show you a lot of information on how to, how to do this. Now, there's a lot of important things to realize during, during social, for social media. You know, pulling in, to your point, about the maps and pictures and, and copyright issues. Information is there, especially during a crisis, to pull in. You don't want to be that rogue person bl blurting out misinformation. If, if I, if I um, put an at ampersand signal and I put SBDC or, or um, CS, SBDC, or SBA, all of a sudden I'm the authority because guess what? I've pulled in people who can fact check my information right there on the spot. My information, if you share it, please share my information. At Wake and Smile, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my profile on, on Twitter if you want to follow me. Um, but if you share my information, it's gonna, it, it, it is meaningful information, and then I actually want you to get that out, out there for you. I mean, I post random and cool and exciting stuff, so if you wanna follow me, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> um, but, um, so if you refer to an authority, you can refer to me in a disaster, you can refer to Brian or Liz or anybody in a disaster situation. It, make, it helps you let others know that you're not just putting out random, you know, words or whatever. And what it does is it gives an opportunity for that person or that community to be drawn into your conversation. So if you're putting out, well, there's a fire on this road or this road, they can go, oh, thanks for posting that information. Here's the details. Here's the map to bolster your conversation and actually improve the way that you're communicating to help your message thrive with your community. Because you'll get looked to as the resource when disasters happen. People will trust you. How many of you would like your clients or prospects to know, like, and trust you? I think we all would. Social media gives us the advantage. But we need to start it sooner rather than later because it's not an if a disaster is going to happen. It's a when is a disaster going to happen. And if we start posting when we hear about that disaster, as we already know, it's too late. It's 30 seconds too late. And you want to start your crisis communication plan through social media? It's not going to happen. So. Um, another, uh, just a kind of a, a quick tidbit, is try to remember simple things of time stamping your information. That way it's current, people know when that information came out. Because they'll tell you two days, two weeks, or whatever, but sometimes situations are up to the minute. And we need to know. Um, and if there is any misinformation out there, it's a really great opportunity for you to correct that. You know, a lot of people think that the Red Cross is all about, you know, donations and different things in this simple example. They're not about that. That's a Salvation Army thing. And right there, instantaneously, when people are coming with their, you know, bags of clothes and their food, they can change directions and give it to where it's supposed to be. So you can help the conversation thrive. But also remember, you're dealing with people, number one. So you have to have a, an action steps and empathy 
to show that you are, there's a person behind those words. The words that you put out, people resonate with. And you have to have a conversation from a real point of view. Now, there's a you know, crisis communication checklist that, um, you know, different steps that you can go through. I mean, you can go on our website or, or preparemybusiness.org or preparemybiz.org, which is a co-branded website with us and the SBA where you can get a lot of this information with. But you need to start somewhere. You need to know that your, your message is different for your community, stakeholders, media, everybody. What a great opportunity right now to make a good, good contact so that way when the disaster happens, you don't have to call uh, channel 11. You can already have those contacts so that they can be in your crisis communication plan and they can help you. Um, but stay on target. Don't, don't strive to outdo or updo or, or overdo somebody in, in social media. Keep it to the point. Keep it simple. Um, keep it frequent. Don't put out too much information, just enough. But I've got, all, I've got a lot of things for you. Um, you know, here's a simple, you can download a crisis communication checklist. Please contact me. I mean, my, I'm here to help your goals and your actions. But here's a, a simple place to start that you can walk away. And uh, anybody who creates a plan to utilize one action step to um, communicate with their employees by the end of the month, I will give you a winter weather preparedness uh, uh, packet and program to help your organization thrive during what's going to be a cold winter to put you on step two, uh, so that way, together, we can make better steps to have a safer community. So, thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Anybody have any questions for Trevor? Yes. Wake, like wake in the morning, and wake and smile is my, is my username. I, I just... Wake, yeah, I, I get really excited about this, and then I'm just really excited about the day. So. I wake and smile. So, um, <laughs> um, man, I just knocked it out of the park, didn't I? Nobody has any questions. Okay. Anybody else? I think it owes to our first panel uh, to talk about how important it is to be concise, correct, and very succinct when you're communicating. Um, on Facebook, if I put up a snowfall accumulation graphic for next week and I put text with it, what do you think the first question is that I get? How much snow is Colorado Springs going to get? It says right there. Read. Just a little bit. That's all I'm asking you to do. But in this extremely convenience-driven society that we live in, Everybody wants the information now, and probably about 60, maybe even more percent of the population wants you to do it for them. So when you explain something and you're verbose, um, chances are you're not going to be communicating effectively, which is another point to Twitter. Twitter allows you 140 characters in a statement. 140. You talk about being concise, you'll learn very quickly to become very concise when you're tweeting to try to get that information out there. So, and as a media uh, outlet that's looking for information, we're always looking for that as well. The faster you can get it out, the more correct the information is and the more succinct that you put that information out there, it's very important, okay? Anybody have any questions for our panel on what we've talked about today? Yes, sir. Um, anybody who wants to email me, I'll give them my slides. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if it, does Liz. Liz, are you going to give everybody the slides from the presentations? Um, let me talk with Asia. I didn't know what the plan was, but I'll find out who's coming next. Sure. Emails. But you guys are comfortable just if somebody kicks you an email, yeah, yeah. you can get, get the slides out to them. Oh, Steph one. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, the question was, is if you search hashtags within different platforms, Facebook via Twitter, what do you see? If I search hashtag in Twitter, I will find hashtags in Twitter. But if I do hashtags on Google, then I will find it throughout multi-different 
media. So if you want a hashtag, like in LinkedIn, I'll, I'll have that connected with my Twitter feed so that I send out one message on LinkedIn or one message on Facebook, and that actually goes directly to Twitter. So if I want to hashtag or ampersand somebody or whatever, um, I only have to put that message out once, but it will be on both platforms. And it's really simple to network those two together. It takes about 30 seconds. Quick question. Okay, so a lot of what I've heard is not only sending it out, but obviously the key is getting that information. And a lot of times it's actually coming to the company that's retweeting and reposting and putting it out from, from another source. So in, in order to ensure that um, we're uh, properly scrubbing the web, crawling the red web, if you will, for tweet that, tweets, excuse me, and uh, it, are there software right now that allow you to utilize stuff like Boolean logic and uh, other search mechanisms? Familiar? I'm familiar with that, yeah. with that one. I don't know what that one. So one of the things that you have to be careful of in, from, and this isn't the use of the tools, but it's in validating that information. So again, we've kind of hit this point, and it really, you can't hit it enough, is validate those sources ahead of time. Um, and in your crisis communications, you don't want to be just grabbing somebody's information out there that you haven't watched, that you haven't followed. Again, I think you know Matt and Trevor hit it over and over is you can't do this the time of the disaster. So if you haven't pre-validated those sources, you know from the non-technical side that I do come at it, don't be retweeting them. I mean, unless they're a validated source, and there's certain ways. I mean, that you can you can look for the validation marks. You know, and there are valid sources. We know um, El Paso County uh, PIO was one that a lot of us used during the fires. You can validate that one. You know, KKTVs is validated. You know, all of our business ones are validated. So you can go and you can actually make sure that those are legitimate people. But if you start retweeting people that you know maybe throwing some extra information out there, not a good idea. So, use what's up here. Absolutely, but I, I guess bring it back to the question of a strategy for ensuring, and I, maybe this just isn't relevant for the smaller community, smaller relatively, uh, of Colorado Springs versus uh, somebody that's concentrating on a perhaps an international or international um, scope in which there's a lot of different sources out there it's almost like you, you also want to ensure that you don't know, miss something um, from someone who hasn't been previously vetted, but may still have information that is accurate. Um, so a uh, strategy for ensuring that you yeah, I mean, there are different softwares out there that are available to you at different price points. I think the one that I probably suggest the most to people is, is Hootsuite, H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E. There you could put in a hashtag, and it will catch a lot of what's going on in the hashtag, say whether it's on Facebook or Twitter. So that's a good way to kind of combine social networks into one dashboard, one place where you can look at everything. There are other things. Um, Google Alerts um, has kind of transitioned now to people using what's called Mention. Um, you can just Google Mention. It's a monitoring service where you can do um, that search style you're talking about, if this, then that. You can do different keywords put together. You want to crawl the web in general, so that's blogs, websites, Twitter, Facebook, everything in one. Uh, mention's a good one. Uh, and if money is no object, uh, which I'm sure it is, I said money is an object to everyone, uh, you know, we at the university use uh, Salesforce for what was used to be called Radian 6. And that thing is, you're talking thousands and thousands of dollars per year. Um, but that's a great thing, because only a few companies have access to the unfair fettered, complete access to the Twitter fire hose, as they call it, and Radiant 6 is one of those. So they get every single tweet, every single thing off Twitter uh, that you can crawl. But yeah, Mention, Hootsuite uh, are two good ones to look at that are very reasonably priced. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, way of doing that, and I know a lot of people don't have time to do that kind of research. 
searching, but being able to do it yourself and know for a fact that everything is the way it's supposed to be is really the best key for me. Okay, very good. And from a media source too, there are media sources that will only tweet or Facebook scanner traffic. Do you guys know what scanner traffic is? We're talking, if you've got a police scanner, and you, like we were saying, you can get these on your phone, okay? Broadcastify, there's all kinds of things on, on the web where you, if I wanna know what the, uh, the Boston PD is talking about right now, I can be on their scanner in about 30 seconds. And whatever they're saying, I can tweet that out. Now scanner traffic, these are, these are our first responders dealing with mayhem at that time and trying to decipher information as quickly and the best way that they can. About 50%, maybe less, of scanner traffic is actually factual in the end. That's extremely dangerous when you're, when you're tweeting that or Facebooking that information out there. Um, but there's this desire to be first. It's great to be first, but if you're always wrong when you're first, <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's going to do a lot of damage there. Plus, as businesses, if you're dealing with a crisis, you don't want to sort through that garbage um, because it's not, only, uh, it's, it's not only emotional because you're dealing with that, but it's confusing, it's misleading or whatever. I'm just saying that there, there are these pitfalls. So, I mean, social media is great. It's not the golden child. You have to still use your brain through stuff like this, but the whole scanner traffic thing is, is a real problem during a crisis. So, please use caution and only trust those sources that, that you can rely upon for that. Yeah, okay. to, to make your point, Brian, also, uh, I'm sure some of you in the room are familiar with the school shooting that just happened north of Seattle a few weeks ago. I did some research on that for my personal blog uh, and dug into the historic tweets about how that unfolded on social media. Uh, the very first tweet that came out about that happened about 90 seconds after the shots were fired by a student who was walking into the cafeteria who said, there's a gunman in the cafeteria, don't go in there, and he said, I'm running away. Um, that was the first thing that came out. About three minutes after the very first 911 call, I said people started doing that, tweeting scanner traffic information, which I said a lot of it turned out to be not be true. I said these first responders are getting information and trying to sort through what's real and what's isn't. And I said you hear it on the scanner as it's coming across, but again, that doesn't mean that it's verified actual factual information. So again, this goes back to the immediacy of Twitter. Of Again, a student tweeted it within a minute of it happening, and I said it was already in the public um, being tweeted around from people about probably 30 minutes before any news organization actually mentioned it, picked it up, um, from people that were, again, listening to scanner traffic or saw a tweet from that student. So when I look at that tweet from that student that sent that and said there's a shooter in the cafeteria, I looked at his profile, it says, I'm a student at this high school and he has thousands and thousands of tweets. He has friends, I look back at his history, I'm looking at his photo history on Twitter, seeing school pictures. I can trust that he's probably telling the truth and that if I see more and more tweets coming out, he is definitely a source that was probably actually there. And again, it could have been a joke, a terrible one, but again, I can at least know that he's a student there. Uh, and it can, he gives him a little bit more credibility as I dig into his profile and see that actually, yes, he is an established user. His profile says he is a student there. I at least know that about him. But again, that did happen also in that shooting in Seattle. And I said there was a lot of information that got put on Twitter in the first hour that actually turned out to be incorrect.